yeah, for those that I have not met yet, um, I'm the interim and, and uh, very happy to be here, very excited to be here, believing in great things for the future here at Bethel. Um, but today is 9-11, and uh, I think it's appropriate for us to take a moment and to reflect and remember 2,977 people entered eternity on this day after the 9-11 attack. 25,000 were injured, and we have no idea how many have died from the after effects. And so I just wanted us to take a moment this morning and remember. And so we're just going to take a moment because this was our backyard where this happened. And there are people in our community that are still being impacted and affected by that day. So let's just wait. Father, we remember that day, and we remember the families that were impacted. And God, we pray for your comfort. We pray for your peace. Lord, I pray that your spirit would lift up those that on this day relive that horrible moment. God, we ask for the grace and the mercy to be evident that, Lord, you would make up the difference in each one, and we will be careful to thank you and give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's appropriate for us to stop and to remember, to reflect, uh, but the truth is, is we don't very well. We've seen the banners, never forget. I see it on vehicles, and yet we still forget. Uh, it's, one of, it's a blessing and a curse to remember and to forget. Um, it's, a, it's a blessing in that uh, when we remember, we don't repeat the same mistakes. It's a... It's a curse, or no, it's a blessing when we remember so we don't repeat the same mistakes. It's a curse when we forget and do the same thing over and over. And so as we uh, take a moment today and we remember what happened, um, Israel's history is marked with their forgetfulness. Uh, this morning, uh, I've entitled this message, What Do We Do Now? Because in the book of Micah, uh, they forgot God. It's not a whole lot different than the United States. Uh, I think the United States has forgotten God. Uh, we were founded not as a Christian nation, but on Christian principles. And we have, the, the nation has, has veered so far off course that we are now reaping the whirlwind. And I don't think you have to be a rocket science to recognize the fact that we're in trouble. Um, we are in trouble politically, we are in trouble economically, we are in trouble educationally, socially, um, and ultimately the real trouble is spiritual. We have lost our spiritual mooring and so we are adrift heading towards eternity with no frame of reference to move forward in a positive and productive way. My son, while we were on vacation, uh, recommended a book. And, and um, I read because I have to, not because I like to. Um, it's, it's just part of my makeup. But when I get a good book, I... I I read it, and I read it quickly, and, and it was a book, it was entitled The Coddling of the American Mind, How 
good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. And it's interesting because it's not a, it's not a Christian book. It was written by a First Amendment attorney and a social psychologist, and they both profess they lean left. But it was written with uh, the premise that uh, people with good intentions but bad ideas are derailing our ability to succeed or this next generation's to succeed. And there were three untruths that they said that they embraced that caused this demise of this generation. And the first one was whatever doesn't kill you makes you weaker. And um, the, the manifestation of that is uh, our children are very, very fragile and have to be protected from all danger and risk. So we have helicopter parents. You know, my, my wife was a, in the public school for 26 years. And when she first started, if she said, listen, I'm calling your mother, that would put the fear of God in that kid. By the time she finished, she wanted to avoid parents because she's the one that got yelled at. Why are you picking on my kid? <laughs> Helicopter parents. Our kids are not that fragile. They're very resilient. They need to be challenged. They need to face risk. The second untruth is that uh, always trust your feelings. If you feel like you've been offended, you have been. This is where we get the victim mentality. And so, you know, but our culture has embraced it. And then the last untruth is that the world is a battle between good and evil people. And so that um, if you do not agree with the cultural orthodoxy, you're evil. If you do not embrace 250 different genders, um, if you don't embrace uh, socialism, if, if you don't embrace as far crazy ideas, um, you are evil. And, and I've actually seen some of our political leaders say, you're evil if you believe X, Y, or Z. And, and this is the world that we live in, and the author's uh, desire is to help us move away from being so deeply divided. He said our culture has become so hostile and divided, it's because they've embraced these three truths and they have forgotten what is most important. Micah is a minor prophet that was dealing with this same issue. The nation had forgotten about God, and God was coming in to reconcile. Um, the world has always been in conflict against the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world, and we know that the only hope is the church of Jesus Christ. But the church of Jesus Christ has got to not forget who's the head. Jesus is the head of his church. And I know right now we're in a season of transition, and next week I'm going to start a series on taking the promised land, and we're going to look at the life of Joshua in that transition. Um, but we're going, to, we're going to believe that Jesus never stepped off the throne. He is still the head of this body of believers even as you look for your new leader but during Micah's reign or Micah's prophetic ministry he was a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah he's a minor prophet only in that his prophecy was short matter of fact you can sit down and read it it's only seven chapters and I sat down and I read through it in preparation for this and um, this is this is Israel's history uh, God initiates redemption. He picks Israel out. He says, you are my people. 
His people reject him. God corrects them. God reconciles them. The people reject him. God corrects them. Rinse and repeat. Uh, If you read the history of Israel, that's what happens. And guess what? It happens to churches. It happens to nations that uh, were founded at one point. The, The seven churches in Revelation are non-existent anymore. They were living, vibrant communities of faith that no longer exist. They're they're ruins because the people forgot. We need to understand that, that God never forgets. He forgets our sin. He's the only one that has the ability to forget. And we need to understand that that. The Old Testament was written to demonstrate our inability to live by the law and to encourage us to realize that God is not to be fooled with. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote about cheap grace. I kind of say the New Testament is, you know, the Old Testament is about uh, our inability to live by the law, I think the New Testament a lot of times is about our ability to abuse grace. Because Paul constantly writes about, listen, do not live by the sinful nature, but live by the Spirit. Why? Because we have a choice in this matter now. When the Holy Spirit, when we ask Jesus to come in, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us, now we have a choice. Before we didn't. We sinned because we were sinners. Now we're saints and we choose to sin and thank God for his mercy and his grace because he covers us Uh, when we ask God to forgive us he forgives all our sin past present and future now that doesn't mean we shouldn't be repentant we need to continue to believe God for full restoration but Micah 6 8 is a key passage and It gives us what God expects. And it says this, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, does anybody, can anybody figure out what my three points are? It's it's a very obvious passage, but, but we need to unpack this a little bit. So the first thing is to act justly, which is really your personal integrity. Personal integrity is who are you when nobody else is around? When you hit your thumb with a hammer, what comes out of your mouth? We have, we have good Christian profanity. We do. Now, in my head, I know what I'm saying, but I'm not letting it come out of my mouth. We, we, you know, we're, we're I'm, listen, I'm going to be really real with you. I have ADD and I'm going to bounce around a little bit. So, so it's a challenge for you to follow me. And it, that's on purpose. I want you to pay attention. But your personal integrity, when you say you're going to do something, do you do it? If you say you're going to be somewhere, are you going to be there? Um, and this is something that, that uh, has been important to God from the very beginning. In Genesis, the uh, fourth chapter, we have the account of Cain and Abel. And if you remember, Cain and Abel was Adam and Eve's sons. Now, I speculate sometimes and I think, about, but think about being Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve sitting around the campfire at night talking about being in the garden with God and how beautiful it was and how wonderful it is. And, and uh, Cain and Abel are just sitting there and said, yeah, and you guys blew it and we're stuck out here. But we know that Abel worked, uh, had, had flocks and, and Cain worked the ground and somehow there, there's this understanding that, that God is still present with them, but not in the same way that he was in the garden. And they decide they're going to give an offering. And Abel brings the fat of one of the sacrifices 
and Cain brings vegetables, fruit, whatever, whatever he had. And we have no idea why, but, but God accepted Abel and rejected Cain's. And Cain got upset. How many here like to get rejected? Good. You're all well balanced. Uh, but uh, Cain is, is, is upset. And so God comes to Cain and he says this. He says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now, I'm having a, a bit of a senior moment. Um, I think it was in a conversation that I had with Nick. We were, we were talking about doing what's right, and, and he shared something with me that I thought was so profound that, that I thought I'd share it with you. He says, doing the right thing is hard, but it makes life easier Doing the wrong thing is easy, but it makes life harder. And he used lying as, a, as, a, as a, an example. He says, if you lie, you've got to remember what lie you told to what person, which makes it very, very hard. And lying is very, very easy. I like Every time my wife asks me, how, how does this dress look? I lie. It's beautiful. Um, uh, and my wife is beautiful, and, and uh, she always looks good, so in case she tunes in, so. <laughs> the truth is, I found that most people are their own worst enemy. They're their own worst critic. Um, I, at least I know in my life, I, I could find it so much easier to focus on the things that I've done wrong than on the, you know, the one thing I did wrong or the nine things I did right. The one thing that I focus on is the thing that I did wrong. Oh, gosh, I can't believe I did that. And so I don't want anybody to feel guilty or condemned uh, today. I, I just want to encourage you to... Focus in on doing what is right. And do the little things. If you want to have an effective and successful life, focus on doing the little things right, and they will lead to the big things. And the reality is, is it's not that we don't know the difference between right and wrong. We just don't have the ability to choose it apart from the empowerment of the Spirit. That's why our connection to God is so vitally important. Um, we're in a war, but it's not against people. It is against powers and principalities. I was reading in my devotions about the prince of Persia who, who resisted Michael as he was coming to, to speak to Ezekiel. And, and so there are spiritual powers and and principalities that we have to be aware of. And I believe that this region, this tri-state area, Connecticut, New York, uh, New Jersey, I believe that there are powers and principalities that we have to wage war against, but it's not one that you fight physically. It's one that you fight on your knees. It's one that you fight through worship. It's one that you fight through doing what is just. There's only one person who has done this perfectly, and that was Jesus. And the Bible is a book of contrasts. It's a book that, that says, this person got it, this person didn't. And so each one of these points, I, I want to pull out a contrast. And, um, you know, in Micah, it's, it's set up as a courtroom drama where God comes to the, to the nation and says, listen, um, I picked you, I pulled you out of slavery, I provided for you in the wilderness, I help you set up a system that you can be connected to me, uh, and you rejected it. And so uh, if you read in chapter 6 earlier than, than our text, uh, the people's response was, 
What do you want us to do? Do you want us to make an offering to you? Do you want us to offer your, our firstborn? Because that's what the nations did around them. And it just showed how shallow they were spiritually. That they could even conceive that God would want them to sacrifice their children. And the thing is, is our human nature um, has a very strong self-preservation drive. And so we will try to barter with God. We will try to make God uh, or deal with God. Listen, I'll do X, Y, and Z. I'll come to church every Sunday for a year. I will, I will give 12% instead of 10%. And we try to do that to, ju to justify and to satisfy the, the guilt and the shame that sin brings into our life. And so the contrast that I, that I found for acting justly, do you remember the rich young ruler? Rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, um, honor your father and mother, keep the Sabbath day holy, and I forget. But he gave him like four things, and, and, and the, the rich young ruler goes, yes, 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 I've done all those since I was a kid. And Jesus says, you lack one thing. Go sell all you have, give to the poor, and come and follow me. And it said that he walked away sad because he was very wealthy. Do you know we all have one thing? Some of us have two. Some of us have three. But you need to be aware of what is the one thing that you might not be willing to give up in your pursuit of Jesus. That you can't do justly apart from him and following him. The, the people who did do justly uh, are, are the, the crowd on the day of Pentecost. If you remember, Peter gets up and he preaches a three-minute sermon. I know that some of you are sitting there and saying, I wish Pastor Rick preached a three-minute sermon. Um, that's a joke. It's okay. But it, they came to Peter afterwards and said, um, it said they were cut to the heart. And they said, what must we do to be saved? And so I would ask the question, when was the last time you were cut to the heart? That you became so desperate that you just cried out to God, God, what do I have to do to be right with you, to get right with you? It's, you know, I, I, I tend to tear up at Hallmark movies. I, I, I hate it. I, I, I'm getting older, and, and I'm finding my emotions are just driving me nuts now. But, you know, I had to look for the tissues when we were in worship. Why? Because when I sense the presence of God, tears are my, it's the natural response. We need to be cut to the heart. So the first thing, what must we do? The first thing we must do, we must act justly. Second thing, we must love mercy. How many here love mercy? We are all here because of God's mercy. You better love mercy. Um, but um, we are the recipients of God's mercy. And if doing justly has to do with your personal integrity, loving mercy has to do with how you treat other people. How you treat other people is, is the indication of whether or not we understand or embrace mercy. In Luke, the sixth chapter, uh, Jesus says this, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Now, you need to understand, this is how Jesus concludes his admonition on loving your enemies. We don't like that one. 
We, we, we like to pick and choose, you know, uh, in, in Scripture what we, what we want to do. But, but Jesus says, listen, love your enemies. Do good to those, to the, those who despitefully use you. Be merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful. And now mercy is not the same as grace. Grace is, is God's unmerited favor that is found in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And only human beings receive grace. Because we're the only ones that need to be forgiven. Animals don't need to be forgiven. I have people that ask me, will God let me have my dog in heaven? Sure, if you want him. But, you know, you've got a choice. You can hang out with the creator of the universe or a dog. If you're, if you're a lover of dog, if, God want, if you want to have a dog, I'm sure God will let you have a dog. But I think I, I've got better things to do with eternity. Mercy has to do with the relieving of suffering. It's not just treating people nicely when they don't treat you nicely. It is actually working to relieve suffering. And this church has an incredible history of doing that. I've only been here for a few weeks, and, and I was for the, around for the last uh, food distribution, and, and it, I'll, I'll be honest, there are churches with a lot more resources that are a lot bigger that don't do what you do. It is phenomenal what you have done in this area to relieve suffering. And isn't that what Jesus did when he went to the cross? He came and he relieved us of the burden of sin, and he set us free. I've been in ministry for over 30 years, and, and unfortunately, I've had to deal with um, man's inhumanity to man. I, I've had to deal with, with families where the father abused their daughters, where uh, husbands abused their wives, where wives rejected the covering of their their husbands, where children rebelled against their children, their parents. Um, I've had to deal with all those things. And now we've got a 24-7 news cycle that, that just pours garbage into our souls. And, and I used to be a news junkie. Well, now I, I'm, very, I'm very selective in watching news because I don't want it to poison my soul. And it will. It will impact your perspective and your faith if you're not careful. And fortunately, there have only been a couple of times where I've had to, to counsel on separation for the safety of whether it's the kids or the, the, the wife or even sometimes the husband. How we treat people is one of the greatest indicators of our connection to Christ. We can use people through manipulation or intimidation. We can fear people, which would keep us in bondage. As a matter of fact, the Proverbs tells us that the fear of man will be a snare to many, or we can serve them. The greatest example is, is the Good Samaritan that Jesus used. The religious people avoided the man that was beaten and bleeding. But the Samaritan came and he picked the man up and he bound his wounds and he put him on his donkey and he took him to the inn and he paid for his room and said, listen, whatever he needs and I'll, I'll settle up with you when I come back. If we truly love mercy, it's going to cost us. It's going to cost us resources. It's going to cost us time. It's going to cost us convenience. We need to embrace and love mercy. We need to see how can we, we relieve suffering in our area. No one person can do everything, but together we can accomplish a lot. We are always better together. The contrast between loving mercy and the self-righteous is found in the woman caught in adultery. You remember the account in John, the 11th chapter? Uh, the, the religious leaders dragged this poor woman. And I know the question everybody has is, what happened to the guy? 
because if you got caught in the act of adultery, you're supposed to be stoned to death. And so they, they grab this, this poor woman, probably half naked, drag her into the street, throw her in front of Jesus, and Jesus, you know, and they say, listen, the law says this woman who is caught in adultery needs to be stoned. And I'm sure they had the stones in their hands, and, and Jesus looks at this poor woman and does nothing. He just stands there. And I can just, I can see the religion. They're, they're, get, they're getting agitated. They're getting, oh, come, Jesus, Jesus, we got you now. Oh, yeah, I know you can't answer this one, Jesus. I mean, they had been after him ever since he broke on the scene. And all of a sudden, um, Jesus stands up and says, you who have no sin, throw the first stone. And I could just hear, first it's the young guys, thud, the stone drops from their hand. The older guys are looking at Jesus and they're going, oh, oh, I can't believe it. He got us again. They drop the stones and the crowd disperses and Jesus looks at this woman and he says, where are those who condemn you? They're gone then neither do I. Go now and leave your life of sin. Being merciful is not just relieving suffering, it's dealing with sin. If Jesus just looked at her and said, I'm not going to condemn you either, go. That would not have been mercy. Mercy. What was merciful was go and leave your life of sin. That's mercy. It is the solution to the suffering she was experiencing. So we have to act justly. We have to love mercy. The last thing, walk humbly with your God. Can all the humble people please raise their hand? Now, Sorry, as soon as, you, soon as you say you're humble, you lost it. <laughs> Humility. Uh, it's, it, soon as you think you get it, you, you've lost it. Uh, the only person that can declare somebody humble is another person or God. You can't declare yourself, I am one of the humblest people you will ever meet. That just doesn't sound, it's it's. In con- or, uh, I was thinking of a musical term, and I can't, uh, it, senior moment, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> humility is not being a doormat. It's not weakness. It's not low self-esteem. Humility is the inner strength for you to give up your right to be right. I don't have to be right. I'm not going to argue with anybody. I, I got strong opinions. I'll share my strong opinions. But there, I recognize, I, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. Amen. Who is Jesus to you? We're talking about walking humbly with God. Who is Jesus to you? Is he a religious icon? Is he fire insurance? When I started my faith journey over 40 years ago, he was fire insurance. I did not want to go to hell. I I was in my early 20s. I had spent my life uh, in a good middle-class American family. We had no major problems. I had no reason to pursue God other than he put it in my heart. And I started to pursue God, and I got saved at one of those, back in the early 80s, one of those really bad end-time movies. And most of you have no idea what that movie is because it was before you were born. Um, but, and my friend who led me to the Lord never let me live it down. I can't believe you got saved at that stupid movie, but 
I had been three months going to church and because I was, I, I was serious. I wanted to know God and I wasn't going to be fooled. And I was watching people and I was listening and anything that uh, did not smell good, uh, I avoided. But it was at that stupid movie that I, I went forward all by myself. There was nobody else there. And, and I knelt down and I said, Jesus, I, I don't want to go through this, so I'll make you my Lord. He was fire insurance for me at that point. But that began my faith journey. It did not stay there. Because Jesus ultimately became the source of my life. He is not a religious icon to me. He is not, a, he's not fire insurance. He is the source of my life. I cannot live without Jesus. So who is Jesus to you? This, this concept of humility permeates the gospel. Jesus says in Matthew uh, 11, he says, uh, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am humble of heart. He tells us in the 18th chapter, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is greatest in the kingdom of God. Whoever exalts himself in Matthew 23 will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And then Philippians, he being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, death on a cross. And the ultimate picture of humility is when Jesus washes the disciples' feet. On the night he was being betrayed, Jesus takes a cloak, a towel, puts it around him, takes the basin, something that, that a slave or a servant would do, and he knelt down and he washed the disciples' feet. The creator of the universe washes the disciples' feet. In Luke 18, we get the picture of a Pharisee and a tax collector. The Pharisee stands and looks up to heaven and, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. And he gives a list of all the good religious things that he does. But the tax collector stands at a distance, wouldn't even lift his head, beats his chest, and says, God, have mercy on me. God, have mercy on me. And Jesus says, this man went away justified. So what do we do now? We love, we act justly. We love mercy. And we walk humbly with our God. Can we do I surrender? <laughs>